We are here in Wisconsin, and we're currently experiencing some of the coldest temperatures recorded in recent years, reaching as far down as negative 60 degrees. So we know that a lot of you love to go out birding, and even in times like this, you're tempted to go out there. But we're gonna do it for you so that you don't have to. Wisconsin is in the midst of some of the harshest weather this decade. With a polar vortex pushing its way across the Midwest, cold air from the northernmost part of the world has dropped temperatures well below freezing, and both humans and wildlife are trying to cope with it. <laughs> it's not supposed to make that noise. Today, we're examining how in spite of these frigid conditions, birds that overwinter in the north are perfectly equipped to handle even the coldest weather. Our first stop is Retzer Nature Center to see how some of the local species handle the cold. We're at the feeders right outside of the Retzer main building, and we're looking at some of the most common feeder birds that people see during the winter months. So if you look over at the feeder, you'll see a lot of juncos on the ground, and we also have some chickadees, cardinals, and white-breasted nuthatches, accounting for most of what's over here. There's some of them coming in right now. And these birds are all pretty well adapted to surviving in cold climates like this. Even though they look small, they have some amazing capabilities to survive these sub-zero temperatures. What we're going to see while the birds are at the feeder is, first of all, a lot of fluffing, which means that the birds are actually going to be puffing themselves up, and you'll see that they look a little bigger than usual, especially with the chickadees and if we find some goldfinches. When the weather is cold, a bird's feathers are used for more than just flight. Dry, clean feathers act as insulators, trapping pockets of air and warming it. This adaptation assists in preventing heat loss and keeping the bird's core temperature up. This is similar to the way a wetsuit keeps a scuba diver warm, but in the case of the bird, it's a layer of air as opposed to a layer of water. You also might see some shivering, just like humans do. Birds are warm-blooded so they can stay warm by simulating their muscles. We'll also see some roosting behaviors where they'll stick together to insulate each other and to spread body heat. And then we'll probably also see some sunning while we're here where the birds will actually try to get themselves aligned in a place with a little more sunlight so that they can get some natural heat from the sun. It only took about 15 minutes in the icy winds for us to feel the need to warm up. We headed back to the car with frozen hands and equipment. It's amazing just how cold I got that quickly, like with two layers of gloves. Our tripod's having some issues. After seeing how the birds at Retzer dealt with the cold, we went to the Fox River to check out some of the last open water. We're here in downtown Waukesha and we're going to be talking about how some of the avian waterfowl deal with these colder temperatures. Out here we normally have some Canada geese, uh, possibly some different kinds of gulls, herring gulls, ringbow gulls, and normally we have a group of mallards including some fairly domesticated ones uh, that normally get fed. So there's this community that lives down here and they have to deal with the freezing water. So how do birds deal with that? With water temperatures just above freezing, one would think it would be unbearable for birds to spend more than a few minutes in the water. However, most of them look quite comfortable. It turns out these birds have an amazing adaptation to help withstand the icy water. One feature that helps waterfowl stay warm is countercurrent exchange. So the blood that comes from their body is very warm, and when it goes down to their legs, it interacts with the blood coming up. So the blood that goes down is warm, and it cools because it's next to that blood coming up from their legs. So it cools when it goes down and warms when it comes back up. The basic idea of countercurrent exchange is to cool the blood from the arteries before it reaches the feet. This way, the bird's feet receive enough oxygen-rich blood without losing precious heat in the cold. When the cooler blood travels back up to the body through the veins, it is warmed by the arterial blood flowing next to it before it reaches the bird's core, saving energy and heat. In addition, many birds possess a gland commonly known as a preen gland. Located near the tail feathers, the gland secretes a water-resistant oil that can be spread to the outer layer of the bird's feathers through preening. 
By covering the feathers in the special oil and aligning them just right, the bird can essentially waterproof itself to keep its skin and inner layer of feathers warm and dry. In addition to regulating heat loss and waterproofing to control their temperature, some birds also migrate, but they don't always travel to the places you would expect. We talked about a couple of the adaptations that birds have to survive this cold climate here in Wisconsin. So when we think of the cold, we think of a lot of birds flying south for the winter. But a lot of the birds that are here over the winter actually come down from the northern parts of North America near the Arctic Circle in Alaska. One of those birds is the common goldeneye, which we actually have a couple of behind us here. Common goldeneye spend most of their breeding season in Canada and Alaska. During winter, many individuals migrate south in the direction of the Atlantic coast, wintering on inland lakes and rivers where they can find plenty of food. It's cool to see a bird like that coming from so far away just to spend winter in a harsh climate like this. After observing the waterfowl, we decided to head home and wait for some of the winter winds to subside. The forecast called for above freezing temperatures in the next few days, and we decided to postpone the rest of our expedition until then. We've conquered the polar vortex! Part two! It's day two of our expedition to learn about how birds stay warm in the winter. With most of the Arctic winds subsiding, we took the trip back to Retzer Nature Center in hopes of finding two species that migrate to Wisconsin during the frigid winter season. However, before we found either of those species, one small but loud year-round resident caught our attention. One thing that we've noticed so far is that there's a lot of chickadee activity. There was one scuttling around kind of in the underbrush here, and I actually heard one making their springtime call a little bit earlier, which I like. I hope it's a sign of warmer weather for us. The industrious black-capped chickadee is one of the most impressive winter residents of Wisconsin. Each day, chickadees must spend most of their time eating and storing food to stoke their extremely high metabolism. This high metabolism acts as a furnace to the chickadee, quickly burning fat and keeping it warm as long as it continues to fuel itself. Another interesting adaptation chickadees possess is the ability to lower their body temperature by 10 to 15 degrees Fahrenheit at night, reducing their body to a state of extreme inactivity known as torpor in order to conserve energy. So right in this brush pile, there's a couple chickadees, but there's also one of the birds we were looking for, a dark-eyed junco. In most of the eastern United States, juncos appear later in the year and head north in the spring. They are known by many as a sign of winter and are one of the most common birds in North America, with a population estimated to be around 630 million individuals. Dark-eyed juncos are typically dark gray with a white underside. Their bill is pale among other noticeable field markings. They fly through and you see their tail, it's dark in the middle with white on the outside. And that's one of the key ways people identify them. After finding one of our target birds, we moved on to continue our search for winter migrant number two, the normally common American tree sparrow. Having no luck at a few other stops, we headed back to the city where one was waiting for us. There he is, see him? It took almost all day, but we were finally able to find one of the other birds that we were looking for, and that's the American tree sparrow. So much like the dark-eyed juncos, American tree sparrows come from way up north in Canada and Alaska, where they breed, and then overwinter in the upper Midwest and getting even to some of the southern parts of the Midwest. But what makes both of these species, in addition to the common goldeneye, very interesting is that they go from a much, much colder climate to our climate, which is considered more moderate for them. So even though we just had the polar vortex and they had to get through that, they still prefer this sort of temperature over what they would be experiencing up north. So that's a great way that these birds find a way to survive in harsh climates is by moving to less harsh climates. General migration. In spite of the extreme temperatures, the birds we saw seemed perfectly content. Due to many of the adaptations we witnessed firsthand, the birds of the upper Midwest are well designed to flourish in this type of weather. While surviving can still be tough, the birds have everything they need to beat the cold and conquer the polar vortex. Thanks for watching and join us next time on Badgerland Birding.
All right, guys, I'm super excited because we're going to introduce you to a new team member here at Badgerland Birding. He, uh, he's pretty stationary, but uh, I think he'll bring in some good birds. He may also be a unicorn, I'm not sure, but I'm excited to, to have him on the team, and he's going to be a key contributor in the coming months. You are right? Yep. <laughs> Conquered the polar vortex!